Ping is on. <laughs> and uh, we barely got into this Friday. So if you weren't here, you can go back and watch the video and get the rest of chapter 17 and the very beginning of chapter 18. But we talked about very quickly how um, for basically our first 125 years, we were kind of an isolationist country. We were able to stay um, basically um, to ourselves because we had two big oceans on the west and on the east. And uh, countries from Europe and from Asia and the Far East couldn't really mess with us. And we didn't have to worry about them. But then uh, the beginning of the 20th century, and especially after World War II, our foreign affairs, our foreign policy really grew as we became more and more involved in global affairs. Our isolationist policy was kind of uh, enumerated by George Washington in his farewell address that it would be our policy to stay clear of any permanent alliances with any foreign nation. Thomas Jefferson echoed that sentiment. He said, peace and commerce and honest friendship with all nations. Hey, we're going to trade with nations. We're going to try to be good friends to them. We want to have, we want to be at peace with all nations, but we're not going to get tied up in any alliances with those uh, with other nations. If England has a problem with France, we're going to stay out of it. We're not going to get entangled with England or with France. When we talk about foreign policy, we need to understand that we're not just talking about defending our country. Defense is, uh, defense is certainly a part of our foreign policy because it deals with keeping our nation safe and secure. But, foreign, that, but, but the defense policy is a part of foreign policy but it's not the only part. Defense includes military. Our military um, technology, our military uh, forces. Foreign policy also includes our diplomacy. That is how we try to negotiate and get along with other nations using diplomacy, which means uh, trying to uh, discuss and reason through things and deal with things without war and hostility. Foreign policy also entails um, our economic dealings with other nations, our trade policy. and then security exchanges that take place with other nations. This would entail um, getting into organizations like NATO and like the UN, where we are working with other nations to bring security and stability and peace to other parts of the world. Right now, our, our government leaders in the United States are dealing with a very tricky situation concerning Russia and Ukraine. We are allies with Ukraine, but we've had to be very careful with what we say and what we do because we don't want Russia 
because Putin seems to be kind of an unstable guy. He even talked about nuclear weapons. We don't want to trigger Putin to do something crazy and send nuclear weapons into Ukraine or towards the United States or to another ally. You guys will see in the chapter and as you do the chapter 18 worksheet, right now we have four very challenging uh, foreign policy relations with Russia, North Korea, China, and Iran. Russia and China and North Korea, and I guess Iran, all of them we would consider, uh, well, not, not Iran, but the other three are a, a, a com, a, a commun, are communist countries. North Korea is more of a dictatorship with uh, Kim. And I guess we consider Putin a dictator, although he is he is not to the level I we say that, but you never know. But with with Russia and China, we're dealing with two other superpowers who have nuclear capability. Also, we do a lot of trade with those countries. And so that would be another thing that we've got to really be careful with because with COVID, we were hurt greatly, our economy was because we get a lot of things shipped from China. And so if we make China mad, they can say, okay, we're gonna stop shipping stuff. And that would really affect the American economy. With North Korea and Iran, we're dealing with some very unstable leaders and them getting nuclear capability. And I don't know if you guys have ever heard, but Kim at North Korea, he, he keeps test launching these nuclear missiles every now and then, sending them into the uh, Sea of Japan or the North China Sea. And it makes us nervous, makes people nervous. But anyway, our foreign policy deals, in, encompass, encompasses all these things. You might think of the acronym DIME. D is for diplomacy, I is for information, M is for military, and E is for economy. These are all components of foreign policy. All righty, so um, this, this slide says for 150 years, so they're gonna, be, they're gonna be going back even before we were officially a country. But we had the policy of isolationism. What is this, isolation therapy? Anybody know what movie that's from? What About Bob, a classic 1991 hit with Bill Murray, Richard Dreyfuss. It's about a guy, mentally unstable patient, who follows his psychiatrist to his vacation home during the summer and basically drives a psychiatrist crazy. And there's one, one scene, scene where uh, the psychiatrist is driving the patient on this backwoods road and he makes him get out of the car and he drives off and the guy says, what is this, isolation therapy? Anyway, you, you'll really love What About Bob. So we were an isolationist country. Then we started to have a little uh, additions to that policy. Like in 1823, the Monroe Doctrine was established. In case you forgot what that is, this is basically the United States telling Europe 
stay out of any affairs in North and South America. Do not mess with any countries in the Western Hemisphere. If you mess with, uh, let's say, for example, um, if Spain declares war on Brazil, you're going to cause the United States to come down south and help Brazil. So that's what the Monroe Doctrine was. So um, we still were isolationist, but we kind of adopted a good neighbor policy. Like a good neighbor, uh, instead of State Farm, it could be said, like a good neighbor, the US is there for you countries of South America and Central America and Canada too, since Canada is a part of North America. Also during the 19th century, the 1800s, the United States expanded westward, right? Manifest destiny. We're, we're going west, young man, and we're eventually adding uh, the Louisiana Territory, and then we're annexing Texas from Mexico, and then we're adding the Oregon Territory, and then California in the Northwest Pacific until we've gone from sea to shining sea, right? And uh, while we're doing that, while we're buying land from other nations and we're fighting with other nations over land, we are basically dealing with foreign nations. But it's, it's isolated still to our continent. And we had this sense, as I shared just a few minutes ago, it was called manifest destiny. It's a, it was a belief that God had started America with the pilgrims. And um, it was our destiny to conquer the land and establish a Christian nation that would be a bright and shining light for all nations. And um, which included subduing the native population, right? And uh, that manifest destiny just became more and more secular. And um, continued on very strongly throughout the 18th century, 19th century. Another thing that caused us to start to grow and stretch out of this isolationism was um, our expansion commercially. We, um, along with the good neighbor policy that we had with Latin America, we also had an, out, an open door policy for China uh, during the early 1900s, where we started to do more trade. And so it was an, it was an expansion economically and commercially. Some other things that uh, caused the isolationist philosophy to stretch and eventually break there was an addition to the Monroe Doctrine called the Roosevelt Corollary. And this would be from Teddy Roosevelt, which said the United States had the right to intervene in its neighbor's domestic affairs if they were unable to maintain order and their own business. So now instead of, let's say, instead of Spain coming to Brazil during Teddy Roosevelt's time, if there were two political parties in Brazil and they started a civil war in Brazil, then the United States 
had the right to intervene in their domestic affairs. That is a very, uh, that's a pretty arrogant assertion, isn't it? That we would have the right to insert ourselves into one of our neighbor's own affairs without them asking us. And then the Truman Doctrine came along uh, after World War II, and it was a policy of containment. And we'll talk more about containment here in a, right now. Containment was the theory that if one country became a communist country, then the countries around it, its neighbors, would also become communist. That is known as the domino theory. Have you guys heard of the domino theory? Maybe in some past US history classes. So um, in order to stop the domino theory, Truman and his, his um, administration came up with the containment policy. And so this really, this really happened after World War II. During World War II, let me get a little chocolate candy because my tummy is rumbling. I only had a small bowl of cereal for lunch. So if you look here, during World War II, we were on we were with the Allies. That included us, the Soviet Union or Russia, Britain, and China. So keep that in mind. During World War II, we were fighting with Russia and with China. After World War II, and we defeated Germany and Japan, immediately what was started was called the Cold War. Russia, who had been our ally, they wanted to expand into Western Europe. They quickly took over Eastern Germany. We got alarmed because even though we had been allies with them in the war, they were still basically a communist country. We were a capitalist country, democracy. So we, we, we made sure that uh, West Germany was on the side of the US and, and Britain, even, even the city of Berlin, the capital of Germany, was divided into East and West. Sorry, I shouldn't have got a chewy candy. It took me a while to chew. Russia and China continued to show what we felt was aggression with other countries like Greece. And then if you look up here, Korea, Vietnam, and Laos. And so the containment policy said, we can't let Laos or Korea or Vietnam become communist because if one of them becomes communist, it's going to just topple over like a domino into its neighbors. And, and all of these countries will go down like dominoes and become communist countries.
political and military and United States historians are still arguing about whether the domino theory was really a valid theory. So World War II led to a historic shift away from isolationism. And what we would say is the next, so we went from isolationism or an isolationist policy to the next one, containment policy. These are all laid out in your book. From, from containment, we went to pre, preventive war policy. getting into a war to prevent the spread of something like communism. And that, that's something that the Vietnam War was, or they call it the Vietnam conflict. It went from being containment because before we ever sent troops to fight in Vietnam, we had had military advisors in Vietnam for a good 10 years. And they were over there to try to help the uh, South Vietnamese um, <clears throat> be, ha, help, to help them to keep from being taken over from the North Vietnamese to contain the, the communism. But when we started sending troops over there in the early 60s, it went from containment to preventative war. And let me just go very quickly to the textbook because I know there's a couple that I'm missing. And I am aware that it's 11.43, so we'll do this very quickly. <clears throat> you guys see the textbook there? So isolationism to containment to preventative war. Some people said we should try appeasement. And this is the policy where you try to stop war by giving in to the demands of a hostile power. Britain tried this with Nazi Germany and it did not work. Then there's, then there's deterrence. Deterrence is where um, a nation tries to convey their peaceful intentions to other nations, but at the same hand, they also are making it clear that they will be willing to fight. An example of this is um, during the Cold War with Russia, we made it very clear to Russia that we did not want to have war, but we continued to build up a very large arsenal of nuclear weapons that included over 1,500 nuclear warheads. So. We were, we were making it clear we, we, want, we want peace, we don't want war. But on the other hand, if you should start something, we're going to be ready to go. We're going to be ready to rumble. And so those things were happening during the Cold War with Russia. And then especially with, um, with Reagan, we moved into a more globally focused multilateralism type of foreign policy. And this is the type of dealings with other nations that uh, just doesn't entail military combat or diplomacy or containment, but 
we're going to wage war now through the monetary system. We're going to we're going to try to hit you economically where it hurts you as a nation. We're going to cut off trade. Um, we're going to we're going to and we see this especially today. We're going to move into bioterrorism that could affect the environment. We're going to send in chemical warfare. And so this multilateralism, multi means many, lateralism would be a many layered thing as opposed to unilateralism. Our foreign policy, and especially when it comes to our defense policy towards other nations is multi-layered. It doesn't just involve going to war. And it kind of was, I, I said it started with, with Reagan, but George Bush kind of put it into words when he called uh, in 1990, he said, it's a new world order. So we'll stop there with a the new world order. Anybody have a question? Have a good Monday, a good Tuesday. And we'll see y'all Wednesday morning if the creek don't rise. <laughs>